Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another lesson in social psychology. Today's topic will be interpersonal dynamics. Interpersonal dynamics is kind of a name that I decided to call this portion of the uh, of the lesson because saying attraction, aggression, and altruism over and over as a topic is uh, a little annoying. Um, so interpersonal dy dynamics broadly, what that definition is, is the types of communication between individual people, how individuals communicate with each other and build and grow relationships um, or destroy those relationships. So we're going to be talking about three major topics today, aggression, attraction, and altruism. And we're going to start with aggression. So aggression basically means hostility towards another human being. It can be verbal aggression, like yelling and insults and cursing, or it can be physical aggression, like fighting. Um, we also talked about relational aggression before, which is when you try to damage someone's standing within a social group. Um, all of these types of aggression have similar causes, though. One cause is genetic. So you can have a genetic predisposition to be more or less aggressive, and that's sort of part of your temperament when you're born. It can also be neurological. Increased stimulation to the amygdala increases the amount of aggression a person experiences, and decreased stimulation to the amygdala decreases it. So we know the amygdala is related to the fight-or-flight response. It kind of makes sense that neurologically um, changes in stimulation in the amygdala will influence how aggressive we feel. Aggression is also influenced by hormone levels. Um, high testosterone is correlated with aggressive behavior, but it, they actually influence each other. So if a person behaves more aggressively, their body will start to produce more testosterone. And if their body produces more testosterone, then people start to behave more aggressively. Um, so this is kind of a reciprocal influence. Remember that reciprocal means uh, things kind of happen in a circle that, you know, testosterone boosts aggression, aggression boosts testosterone. So they kind of cyclically influence one another. That's what that word reciprocal means. So I thought that, I thought that was really interesting. That might be why um, we tend to see more aggression, more physical aggression in people that are, that their sex is male, right? And we talked about that when we talked about sex and gender, that the physical aggression tends to be higher in uh, male people. Uh, that could be partially hormonal. Also, alcohol. Alcohol has a pretty strong influence over aggression. Four out of ten violent crimes and three out of four instances of domestic abuse involve alcohol, probably because alcohol lowers inhibitions and depresses the part of your frontal cortex that is responsible for self-control and moderation of behavior, um, which then allows those aggressive drives from the limbic system to kind of uh, be expressed more frequently. Another cause of aggression is being frustrated. Um, this is called the frustration aggression principle. Frustration, which means you have a goal that's being blocked, like you're trying to do a thing and something else is blocking you or stifling that attempt, that creates frustration. Frustration creates anger. Anger generates aggression. So basically, this is sort of a cornerstone of understanding aggression. It's called the frustration aggression principle. It was first theorized in 1939, and the theory was further uh, developed in the early 40s. But So it's been around for a while, but basically, if you're frustrated, it makes you aggressive. And I think anybody that's ever been on a losing streak in a video game and then smashed their controller into something out of rage can appreciate the frustration aggression principle. Um, aversive stimuli also increase aggression. So what does aversive mean? Remember, a in Latin means like away from, and vert, V-E-R-T, means turn. So to avert something is to turn away, right? So something aversive is something that makes you turn away, which in this case would be something bad, something you don't like, something unpleasant, right? So aversive means kind of unpleasant or bad. Unpleasant stimuli make us more aggressive. For example, there's lots of research proving that there are more shootings. More people shoot each other when it's hot outside. I'm not kidding. That's really true. There's a lot of research. I have a chart here on the, uh, on the screen, which I took from an article in the New York Times. Um, but this has been supported with lots of data from all over the place. There are more violent shootings, uh, more victims of violent shootings per day in hot weather. Um, so the weather, the, de the degrees are kind of scaled on a weird scale here, but the fours and fives are higher, and the 0.5 and the one is, is lower temperatures, colder temperatures. Um, and you can see there's a pretty dramatic increase 
in shootings per day when it's hot and then when it's cold. So um, I thought that was really interesting. But yeah, basically, if you're dealing with an unpleasant experience, if you're having a bad time, if there's a loud, annoying noise that you can't get away from or something smells bad or whatever, you're more likely to be aggressive. I can tell you that um, in the last month that we've been off of school, I've been having some aversive stimuli, like my kid is whining a lot or I'm hungry or something else, and it makes you snappy at your family, right? I'm sure you guys have experienced something like that before too. Being hangry is an example of this, uh, aversive stimuli causing frustration, which causes aggression. Next, let's talk about attraction. Um, attraction is basically, we're talking about love and romance, but we're also talking about physical attraction here. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that can influence attraction. One of them is proximity. You can't fall in love with someone you've never met. People tend to form stronger attractions to people that they see every day, and people that they're close to. Physical proximity is important. Um, next, the mere exposure effect. This one is pretty fun. The more exposure you've had to a stimulus, the more you like that stimulus. So this applies to people. If you see people more often, you tend to be more attracted to them. But it also applies to non-people things. This is We kind of tend to prefer the familiar, right? The things that we've seen a lot, we tend to form preferences to them. But this also applies to people. Um, another study on the mere exposure effect was about mirrors. And you may have heard of this before. It was kind of famous a few years ago on the internet. Um, people prefer their own image in a mirror over a photograph of themselves. Because if you look at yourself in a mirror, you're seeing yourself um, flipped, right, backwards in a mirror. So your left side is on the right in the mirror and vice versa. So we tend to prefer that mirror reflection over an actual photograph of ourselves. This might be why people kind of are like don't like how they photograph. Try mirroring the image and see if you like the photo better, right? This can be a little experiment you do at home um, to see if you're subject to the mirror exposure effect, right? Uh, but basically, if you see a person a lot, you tend to be more attracted to them. Uh, similarity. We are more attracted to people that are more similar to ourselves. It's the concept that opposites attract is a myth. It's not real, right? We are more attracted to people that share our common goals, that share our interests, that share our attitudes. If people like what we like, if they look at the world in the same way, if their schemas are similar, if they're uh, morality is similar, their ethics, what they think is important, values, um, religion maybe, or a type of music that you like, or dress. Um, all of these things, if they're, if they're more similar with another person, we tend to be more attracted to that person. Now let's talk a little bit about love. Basically, there are two different kinds of love, passionate love and companionate love, and there are probably more um, I'm sure this kind of bleeds over into the study of literature. You might have learned about the different types of love in your English classes. Um, but for psychologically, when we talk about romance or bond, romantic bond between people, um, we have passionate love, which is this sort of highly intense, um, it's sort of like the infatuation period at the very beginning of a relationship when people are all over each other, they're making out in the hallway, they can't stop holding hands, they're constantly obsessively thinking about the other person and they're highly aroused. Um, that is called passionate love. Usually that starts closer to the beginning of a romantic relationship and doesn't last forever, right? The kind of love that lasts a long time is companionate love. Companionate love is when the affection is deeper um, and a stronger sense of attachment and bond that we feel for people that our lives are intertwined with. Right? So this is the kind of love you would have with a spouse when you've been married for 30 years and know everything about each other. Um, it's sort of a deeper bond. So imagine it being kind of like bodies of water, right? Passionate love is like an ocean that's in a storm. So there's lots of big waves and big emotions and big feelings, but it's near the shore, so it's kind of shallow. Companionate love, the surface is stiller, but the water is very deep. Um, so it's sort of a different, and often in long-term relationships, the passionate love will change into companionate love over time, and not always. Um, that's why people can feel like they sometimes will fall out of love with each other, um, and it's because that passionate love is not permanent. Some things that can influence how well a relationship lasts, right? We were talking about long-term relationships and how sometimes relationships will burn bright and then flame out. Um, what influences a relationship to last longer, one is equity and the other is self-disclosure. Equity means people 
get out of a relationship what they put into it. So if you put a lot of energy into a relationship and the partner puts a lot of energy into a relationship, each partner will equally get back what they give, right? So if you trust another person, that tends to make them want to trust you back. If you give respect to a person, that tends to make you, them want to give you respect back. So it's kind of like having a proportional or equitable give and take in a relationship. And if that doesn't exist, it tends not to last. Like if one partner is doing everything and the other one isn't contributing, that is not an equitable situation. It tends to breed resentment and make relationships fail. Um, the second one is self-disclosure. Talking about yourself, revealing intimate things about yourself and your thoughts and what you think is important um, to other people increases mutual caring. It increases the caring of both, right? We talked about attitude change and things like the foot in the door phenomenon and how doing small things for others makes you like that other person more by influencing their attitude towards them, right? So if I shared a lot of myself with another person, then that act of sharing convinces my brain that, oh, you're sharing a lot of details with this person, therefore you must trust and care about them. So it actually makes me trust and care about that person more, right? So it's your self-disclosure that makes you care for another person more, not their disclosure to you, your disclosure to them, right? And vice versa, if they disclose a lot to you, then they will like you more. So that like talking and conversation and intimate sharing of, of uh, discussions makes both people have a deeper caring for the other person. The last concept we're going to talk about today is altruism. Altruism is unselfish regard for the welfare of others. So what this means is that doing things to help other people or showing caring for other people with no expectation of reward or benefit for oneself, right? The TED talk that you watched at the beginning um, as the sort of warm up activity for this lesson was all about altruism and it's at the bottom. Um, the link is at the bottom of this slide if you wanted to watch it again. Um, but there are some factors that increase altruism and cooperation beyond the size of that amygdala. One of them is social exchange theory. Um, this is the idea, so there's some different theories. People have been trying to explain altruism for a long time, right? And one theory is that it's a social exchange. My goal with being altruistic is to try to maximize the benefit for myself and for the group and minimize the cost for each person. If I volunteer at a homeless shelter, it's because I think the benefit I get, such as feeling good about myself, outweighs the cost of my time and effort. So if I feel that the benefit outweighs the costs, I'm creating an exchange. I'm helping society and society is helping me, right? Um, the other theory is superordinate goals. That shared goals, sort of you have, so superordinate is like above the level of just yourself. Subordinate is below the level of yourself, right? So superordinate goals are goals that we have as a whole group or as a society or as a team that override the differences between the individuals in that group, right? The movie Remember the Titans is an excellent example of superordinate goals. And if you haven't seen it, I guess now your homework, such as it is, is to go watch Remember the Titans. Um, Remember the Titans is basically a football movie about football defeating racism. But the way this happens is by the team having this strong desire for victory as a superordinate goal. So their goal to win overrides the racism that they had within the team. Um, so the superordinate goal creates altruism by having people team up for a larger cause. And that is it for the lesson for today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and learned something. I miss seeing everybody. Um, and uh, stay in touch. Say hi. Tell me how you're doing.